नहीं कैमरे से दिखेगा ना तभी तो कोई नहीं तो दिख नहीं हम गलत हम तो वही बोल रहे हैं कि दिख
and we have uh, we already discussed the arguments offered by each of them why they refuted this uh, institutional notion of institutionalized religions. And the second is refusal to have argumentation, be it metaphysical or theological, for one's belief in God or religion. This is connected with experience of the mystical, that is the feeling of the world as a limited whole, feeling of the uh, interconnectedness of the world. Now, and thirdly, religious communication is possible through ethical, aesthetical, and literary manifestations. Now, so far, so good. We have discussed these things before. But the uh, question is, so what? These are two different, these are geniuses from two different modernities, two different worlds. Somehow, their thoughts, uh, they have similarity in their thoughts. So what? Why are we devoting our time to find out the similarities between these two things? So basically, the fundamental question is, why Tagore and Wittgenstein? Or Wittgenstein and Tagore. Now, uh, does it sound like chalk and cheese? In fact, this question uh, seems most prominent as we all know Wittgenstein as a revolutionary philosopher of language who was originally a student of aeronautical engineering in the University of Manchester and also as an illustrious student of Barton Russell and G. E. Moore in the University of Cambridge. Whereas Tagore was an artistic and literary genius who was reluctant to be referred to as a philosopher. They are conventionally seen as having very different interests and are usually studied separately. So why should we be bothered to compare a philosopher with a poet? To answer this, we have to go back to the time when Wittgenstein was thinking of publishing his early manuscript, Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. He had sent the manuscript first to Gottlob Frege, because Frege was the one who first, uh, who sent Wittgenstein to Cambridge to study with Russell uh, on the philosophy of mathematics, on the foundations of mathematics. Now, he sent his manuscript first to Gottlob Frege, his mentor. Frege was not happy at all with the manuscript. He asked that uh, one cannot really make head or tell of what you are writing. Whatever you want to write, why don't you write in a simple manner? So, Wittgenstein was thoroughly disappointed. He wrote a letter to Russell saying, Frege doesn't understand a single word of my work and I'm thoroughly exhausted from giving what are purely and simply explanations. Then Russell comforted Wittgenstein saying that, okay, I will write an introduction for your manuscript. At that time, Russell was world famous. And who, who used to know Wittgenstein, just a student in his 20s? So Wittgenstein was happy to have this offer that Russell will write an introduction to his manuscript and it will be, uh, it will be published. But when he looked, at, looked through the introduction, he was completely deserted. He writes in a letter to Russell, now I'm afraid you haven't really got hold of my main contention, to which the whole business of logical propositions is only corollary. The main point is the theory of what can be expressed, what can be said by propositions, that is by language, and which comes to the same thing, what can be thought, and what cannot be expressed by propositions, but only shown. That is for, which I believe is the cardinal problem of philosophy. 
we have already discussed about this distinction between saying and showing, about sensible and not sensible, what can be uh, what can be sensibly stated and what cannot be. Now we have already we have also discussed that logical positivists also mistook Wittgenstein to be a logical positivist. So he was thoroughly disgusted with gross misinterpretations of his book. So then on October 1919, so it was around manuscript is getting circulated from 1916, 17, 18, now in 19, he explained the point of the book in a letter to his friend Ludwig von Ficker. He he in the, in the letter, what is important, he wrote that the book's point is an ethical one. Now, so far, uh, before this uh, letter was out, the major uh, group of interpreters, they used to treat the book as a book of philosophical logic and philosophy of language. No one could think of this, that this book, that the point of this book, a uh, treatise on philosophical logic, is an ethical one. And he hardly uh, referred to ethics in this book. In the last four or five pages, he had mentioned in a few remarks. And here he says, my book draws limits to the sphere of the ethical from the inside, as it were. And I'm convinced that this is the only rigorous way of drawing those limits. And he says that my work consists of two parts. The one presented here plus all that I have not written. And it is precisely the second part that is the important one. Which part? Which he hasn't written. <laughs> so what he has written, that is not important. What he hasn't written, that is the important so, what is he suggesting to his readers? I recommend you to read the preface and the conclusion of the book, which contain the most direct expression of the point of the book. So, what is there in the preface and the conclusion of the book? In the preface and the conclusion, the same thing is there. Here he is saying, that the whole meaning of the book can be summed up in the following way. What can be said at all can be said clearly and what we cannot talk about, we must pass over in silence. And in the conclusion he says, uh, he writes, what we cannot talk about, we must pass over in silence. And we have, uh, we have discussed this, it in uh, the last lecture that we can talk about only about sensible sentences which describe something about the word, which are descriptive statements about the <laughs> word. Apart from that, all other discourses, including logic, mathematics, ethics, aesthetics, religion, metaphysics, and even tractatus, falls into the group which is not sensible, which is nonsense. And he thinks that these are the most important. So the preface and the conclusion of the book emphasize that the project is all about drawing the boundary of what can be sensibly thought. But that cannot be done, for in that case, we have to embrace a contradiction that is to think the unthinkable. The only way out of this impasse is to draw a limit to language, which in a way will draw a boundary to thought as well. And it is possible by distinguishing between sensible sentences from non-sensible ones. From this it follows logically that expressions which are not descriptions of states of affairs by any means cannot be expressed in sensible language. And Wittgenstein's advice is that it is better not to talk about them, but to pass them over in silence. Herein lays the similarity between a poem and the Tractatus. In a poem, everything is not stated. One has to grasp or feel what is not stated by looking at what is stated. In fact, 
one in one of his letters to Ficker, he declared that the work, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, is strictly philosophical and at the same time literary. And he explains, I believe I summed up where I stand in relation to philosophy when I said, philosophy really ought only to be composed in the way in which a work of literature is. Moreover, he wanted to publish his work in a literary journal called Der Brenner, as he himself treated it as a literary work. Engelmann, the closest confidant of Ludwig, uh, tells us that Wittgenstein relates the act of showing to poetry. And poetry can produce a profound artistic effect beyond, but never without the immediate effect of slang. The profound artistic effect that goes beyond the effect of language seems to mean that poetry can show far more than it can possibly say. Or more sharply formulated, poetry says nothing, yet it manages to manifest things that can only be shown. That is why he felt that the poetry conveys the unutterable truth only by not uttering it in any explicit way. This is perhaps also the reason why the poems of Tagore could capture the essence of what Wittgenstein intended to point to. And also, why was Wittgenstein so fond of the poems and plays of Tagore? It is true that there are differences in their attitudes towards language. Still, in spite of their differences, there are contexts which overlap each other. Poets often emphasize on symbols, suggestions, and metaphoric meanings. They believe that most of the time, the value of language lies in its being non-discursive. We know already that in the practitioners there are important things which cannot be stated in sensible language, but the unstated items manifest themselves in what is stated. What links tractators with works of literature is the kind of demand that Wittgenstein places on readers that they respond to what is not there, that is inexpressible in discursive language. It seems if we give importance to what Wittgenstein himself had said about the tractators and try to read it accordingly as a literary work, it might be possible for us to solve the major riddle of the book, how to harmonize the logical aspect of the book with the mystical, with the ethical of the book. And in this venture, understanding Tego's views on language and creativity will have much help to us. However, before one proceeds further, one should explore the relationship of Tego to people of Germany in 1920s. In 1913, he was awarded Nobel Prize, and by 1920, Tego's writings were available in German translation. Tego had visited <coughs> Germany for quite a few times, but his visits in 1921, 22, 26, and 30 are specially significant because during this period, he was literally swayed by the frenzied ovations of the people of Germany. German intellectuals like <clears throat> Rainer Maria Rilke, Albert Schweitzer, Thomas Mann, Stefan Zweig, Guzman Hess, and many others had dialogues with Tagore, and they were moved by the intellectual quality along with innermost spirituality of his thinking. And as I'm just giving you a list of Tagore in German translation till 1927, as because uh, he was reading poems of Gritangi Tandeli in these Vienna Circle meetings in the summer of 1927. <coughs> Just see how many books, 22 
books were already translated in German. In fact, whatever uh, whatever uh, lectures Tagore used to give to his school children at Shanti Niketan in Bangla used to be immediately translated into German and uh, it, uh, it was circulated in, in the population. And uh, all these poets, thinkers and writers were creative and some of them were also Wittgenstein's favorites also. And not only intellectuals, but the common mass of people, they were also influenced by him to a large extent. In fact, Martin uh, Capeshen, uh, who worked on this, he uses the word of uh, that Tagore mania. At that time, the immense popular enthusiasm, the frenzied ovations, which built up to a Tagore mania in 1921, resulting in the sale of one million copies of Tagore books, by the end of 1923, are seen as a proof of the poet's tremendous appeal to the masses and the success of his mission of peace and understanding between the people of East and West. In 1922, Tagore's 61st birthday was celebrated in Germany with much enthusiasm and ovation. Engelhardt presented a 450-page biography of the poet with unadulterated admiration and devotion. The publication of his collected works, eight volumes in 1922 by Kurt Wolf, Fairlag, and its success gives evidence of Tagore mania in Germany. Now, against this background, one can well imagine why Wittgenstein had admired the poems of Tagore. When he recited poems of Tagore to the members of the Vienna Circle, the reason doesn't seem to be casual or non-deliberate. Rather, I think, Raymond, one of the famous biographers of Wittgenstein, seems to be right when he points out, quote, in particular, as if to emphasize to them, members of the Vienna Circle, as Wittgenstein earlier explained to Ficker that what he had not said in the Tractatus was more important than what he had said. Wittgenstein perhaps thought that reading these poems could be an effective form of teaching them what we cannot speak of, we must pass over in silence. This is something which is constitutive of the most fundamental similarity between the poet and the philosopher. In the midst of their legitimate differences, both Tagore and Wittgenstein agree to the fact that there are limits, limits to rational thought and language. But neither is content to accept the limits of reason discussion as ultimate. They believe that there is a beyond that is inexpressible. And the distinction between what is expressible in sensible language, vyakta, and what is not, or vyakta, form the central focus of their respective philosophies. Both Tigger and Wittgenstein wanted to stress the importance of what cannot be expressed in sensible language, of which one should remain silent. Both of them believe that there are limits to language, limits on what can be factually or scientifically articulated. For both, remaining silent plays an important role in their respective discourses, although each has a unique approach to arriving at the same conclusion. They go through literature and Wittgenstein through logic. There is another important factor in their congruence of beliefs, that is indirect communication. Both of them rely on indirect method of communication where straightforward communication becomes impossible. To elucidate the domain of inexpressible incorporates the domain of logic, ethics, aesthetics, metaphysics, and religion. But he can somehow grasp them. He can somehow grasp them by suggestiveness of language, by indirection, 
by bending of meanings through poems, music, drawing, and painting. In fact, this parallel of methodology shows that there are important connections between the poet and the philosopher, which is striking, but overlooked in the history of secondary literature on Wittgenstein. We have discussed in our second lecture that in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein distinguished clearly between the domain of necessity and the domain of contingent. The domain of significant and that of the insignificant. The world as a totality of facts is contingent and devoid of value or significance. But logic and ethics as the condition of the world belong to the domain of necessity and significance. Yet, the two domains are not mutually exclusive. They are linked by the doctrine of showing. The facts of the world display its logic and value. Herein lies the fundamental importance of the concept of showing or manifesting. This distinction, one might argue, carries the basic philosophy of the tractatus, which actually is what I would like to interpret as the journey of from the form to the formless. From rup to or rup. To elucidate, one can point out that the notion of form plays a very crucial role in the tractatus. Young Wittgenstein was convinced about the infallibility of a priori knowledge and believed that the world has a priori forms and so does language and thought. Communication is possible only because of the coincidence of those forms. In order to elucidate how these forms coincide, Wittgenstein says that their limits march. The limit of the world coincides with the limit of language, limits of language with that of logic, limits of logic with that of thought, and the limits of thought with that of self. Now these limits cannot be in the world. This is something which is not in the world. Now what is not in the world, that cannot be described sensibly. Whatever is in the world has some form or other. While discussing how a proposition pictures a state of affairs, Wittgenstein talked about logical form, pictorial form, and representational form. <coughs> These forms are important for the sensical representation of facts, but they themselves cannot be represented in terms of facts. Outside the domain of facts, there lies a huge corpus of discourses. We all know about them, which our sensible languages cannot express. That is why Wittgenstein thinks that values like truth, beauty, and goodness are supernatural. That is, they cannot be described in terms of facts, which are considered to be natural. But how can one become aware of these values? The answer is simple. We are aware of them because they manifest themselves. They are manifest in the structure and limit of the world, which are formless. Hence, the journey for Wittgenstein in the tractatus was from the form to the formless. In fact, the limits of language, thought, and reality are formless, which the forms can only hint at. What is most important here is to see that the formless is manifest in the form, facts, in order to be represented as facts. In order to depict the reality, must possess pictorial form and logical form. <coughs> But these forms themselves, they do not depict or picture the world, hence fail to be facts themselves. But their importance lies in the fact that they manifest the form less, the limits of the world and that of language. Hence, we can conclude that 
according to the philosophy of the tractatus, the formless is the most valuable and is manifest in the forms, but it cannot be uttered, expressed in formal, sensible language. It is inexpressible. Facts are contingent in a sense, valueless. As values are beyond the world of facts, yet our factual world, though valueless from the point of view of the tractatus, can be value-laden when seen from an ethical or aesthetical point of view, as I have discussed in my last lecture, if they are viewed from the point of view of eternity. <laughs> now, one important point is that under the head of inexpressible, we have on the one hand logical aspect of the tractatus, that is logical form, pictorial form, form of a law, representational form, form of the world. On the other hand, ethics, aesthetics, religion, metaphysics, which Wittgenstein simply refers to as the mystical. This creates problems for the interpreters. They feel puzzled. Why a treatise on philosophy of logic should contain remarks on the mystical? And this problem has often been regarded as the riddle of the tractatus. We have so far noticed that the logical and the mystical parts of the tractatus are at par as the condition of the world and they are unsayable yet showable. They all belong to this unseen category of nonsense. If we treat tractatus as a literary work and juxtapose it with the works of Tagore, the riddle can be solved. In the philosophy of Tagore also, we find the journey from the form to the formless and the distinction also between the expressible and the inexpressible. Now coming to the philosophy of Tagore, which I have uh, uh, discussed a bit in my, uh, in my first lecture, he distinguishes between fact and truth, a very important distinction in ontology. And corresponding to this distinction in ontology, he distinguished between science and art. Art with capital A, which includes all forms of art. <laughs> science and art corresponding to this distinction between fact and truth. <coughs> In epistemology, he distinguished between science and art. And corresponding to this distinction in ontology and epistemology, he distinguished between two different uses of language. One is reportive use of language, uh, narrative statement, uh, descriptive use of language. It's like the scientific use of statements. And another is a creative of language. Now, uh, what are the facts? Just a brief discussion. What are the facts? As far as the uh, definition of fact is concerned, uh, I'll not go into the details. Those who know about uh, Wittgenstein, uh, they, they can see that the definition of fact is more or less the, uh, the same. Uh, Tagore defines fact as the characterization of whatever exists in the manner it exists. To state it uh, lucidly, a fact is the existence of a state of affairs. Suppose if I say the table is brown, so the, uh, the brownness of the table is the fact. And whenever I'm saying that S is B, the table is brown, we are not talking about one's thinking or feelings for S or P. Thus a fact being objective and impersonal, becomes the base of our scientific discourse and intersubjective communication. Now, what about truth? Now, this Tagore's notion of truth is quite uh, different, as one, as one doesn't find difficulty in understanding what a fact is, but one finds difficulty in what he means by truth. Tagore identifies this truth with some inner value, which is not extension in space and duration in time. And this eludes factual representation. He treated truth as the truth of relationship, the truth of harmony in the universe, the fundamental principle of creation. creation. To elucidate, facts are impersonal. Facts must be devoid of personal attachments, 
otherwise they cannot achieve objectivity in knowledge. But that also makes a fact an abstraction, makes it separate from the whole, the reality. Regarding truth, Tego thinks that it can be grasped only if we leave the domain of facts, which is limited with the bounds of space-time within the bounds of objectivity, truth transcends these limits. He makes this distinction between fact and truth in his Hebert lectures in Religion of Man. Uh, I, I made a chart of a distinction between fact and truth. Fact is impersonal, truth personal, fact objective, truth subjective, fact incomplete, truth complete. Facts are determined by necessity, does not belong to the domain of surplus, truth belongs to the domain of surplus. Oh. Now facts are necessary, facts are useful for our everyday life, but they cannot reach the truth, the eternal, which is also the personal. Facts are limited to this finite, spatio-temporal, scientific world. As they are objective and impersonal, they cannot be the subject of value judgments. Although it is not stated explicitly anywhere in Tagore's writings that science falls within the domain of sable in terms of facts, still it is obviously so. Same is the case with art, ethics, aesthetics and religion, which are unsayable in factual terms but showable. One can easily notice the distinction between saying and showing implicit in the distinction between fact and truth, science and art. It is surprising to note over here that Tagore was keen on making this distinction in early 1920s. Not only that, what is more interesting is that both the thinkers had their reservations against scientism, scientific culture of the society, and also with the scientific notion of progress. Tagore values art as an expression of truth more than science, so does Wittgenstein. In a letter to Engelmann, Wittgenstein admits that through a work of art, the world may be captured sub spiki eterni, and only the work of art compels us to see the world in the right perspective. And Wittgenstein also expressed his worry that the advancement of science and technology marginalize ethics and the arts and thereby endanger the human spirit. And uh, Tagore, uh, like as far as their expression is concerned, we find that they are very similar. I'm giving a uh, uh, like Tagore and Wittgenstein, fact and man. Tagore writes, facts are like wine cups that carry it. They are hidden by it. It overflows them. Facts are inadequate tools for the expression of truth. So they, are, they cannot carry the whole. They cannot carry the truth. And Wittgenstein, also in the same manner, almost using the same analogy, saying that our words only express facts as a teacup will only hold a teacup full of water and if I were to pour out a gallon over it. That is, facts are inadequate to express the truth. Now, we have said earlier that there is a riddle in the tractatus that is how to reconcile the logical and the mystical. Wittgenstein also thought a lot about it. We find in the quoted part of his diary that I thought a lot about everything possible, but strangely enough, I cannot establish the connection with my mathematical lines of thoughts, but the connection will be established. What cannot be said, cannot be said. Now, he did find the connection in the realm of unsayable but showable in the domain of nonsense. But, and only because of this, he at the end of the tractatus advised us to throw away the book of nonsense. Now we can get to his point, can see the connection rightly 
if we retract it as, as a literary work, as a poem, as expressing the truth. Now here you might object that did Wittgenstein use the word truth as Tagore did in his writings? Uh, one can say that Wittgenstein uses the word truth in the domain of the sensible, in the context of propositions, as an operator when he talks about truth combinations, truth condition, truth possibility, truth operation, truth function, truth type. But these are all in the domain of the sensible. He used the word truth in a different sense when he talked about what the solipsists mean. There he uses uh, the German word die Wahrheit, although most of the translators call it as correct. What the solipsists mean is quite correct. And absolute in, uh, regarding absolute value judgments, what the absolute value judgments point to, and viewing the world as subspecie eternity, as feeling the world as a limited whole. He thinks that the correct method in philosophy would really be to say nothing except what can be said. That is propositions of natural science. And because of this, he writes, we feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problem of life remains completely untouched. And also because of this, the key to understanding tractatus lies in giving much importance to what cannot be talked about in the preface and the conclusion of the book. Although he did not use the word truth, but he meant that there is the truth of the harmony between the logical and the mystical, the outer and the inner, when facts of the world manifest logical form, when facts are viewed from aesthetical point of view, when fa facts are viewed subspecie eternally. Here Tego's works is of help in understanding this connection, in understanding that this connection eludes our speech, that this connection between fact and value. Our minds and words come back, baffled from it. He quotes from Upanishad and he says, Those who pursue the knowledge of the finite for its own sake cannot find truth. This knowledge merely accumulates but does not illuminate. It is like a lamp without its light, a violin without its music. You cannot know a book by measuring and weighing and counting its pages, by analyzing its paper. For him, these are factual knowledge. An inquisitive mouse may gnaw through the wooden frame of a piano, may cut all its strings to pieces, and yet travel farther and farther away from the music. This is the pursuit of the finite for its own sake. Similarly, the absolute infinite is also emptiness. The finite is something, it may be a mere checkbook with no account in the bank, but the absolute infinite has no cash and not even a checkbook. The infinite are fi and finite are one as song and singing are one. So although they have been separated from each other, but there is no conflict. They are not divided in watertight compartments. They are related. Finite and infinite are related. And one shows the other. And there, I think I have not come to the second part also, so I'm, I'm, I'm So in this, in this way, Tagore, connects, relates facts and values, where the facts and values are, are related in the sense of one manifests the other. And we have discussed Wittgenstein's view in the tractators also, that there also the uh, concept of showing, revealing, that ties up, that connects the world of fact and value. And while we are talking about nonsense, we found on the one hand logical forms and on the other hand all these 
discourses, ethics, aesthetics, they all come under one head because they all attempt to express what is inexpressible. The inexpressible, in the terms of the tractators, is to feel the world as a limited whole. The world as limited by the coincidence of the limits of language with those of thought and self. It seems that this inexpressible, the feeling of the world as a limited whole, is the truth of Tagore. When Tagore is saying, feeling yearns to become a part of form, but form desires to surrender itself to feeling. Here also we notice a kind of philosophy of harmony in the tractators, which he includes harmony of fact and form, of form and feeling, and above all a harmony of expressible and the inexpressible, the sable and the showable. Thus we can see that this harmony, the blending of the infinite and the finite, the formless and the form, the visible and the invisible is the key concept of the philosophy of both Tagore and Wittgenstein. But you have to accept that it is also at the same time beyond description or narration in terms of scientific factual language. As these are not sable in ordinary scientific language, its unsability and the mode of silence forms the important key themes in the Tractatus and also in the poems of Tagore. This is the basic similarity in their philosophical point of view. Now I'll come back to our earlier discussion on spirituality and religion. So, so far I have discussed only the meaning of and in Tagore and Wittgenstein. Now I'm, I'm uh, back to our discussion of spirituality and religion. We have discussed earlier that the connection between ethics and aesthetics, art and ethics, is through viewing from eternity. Now viewing from eternity connects ethics and aesthetics with God, the sense of life and the world. It helps us to see the world in a right way. That is to see God or meaning of life and the world in every mundane object or fact. This is another way of saying that God is how things stand. This is also connected with leading a happy life by transcending the mundane life with all its miseries. And entering the notebooks asks, how can a man be happy at all? Since he cannot ward off the misery of this world, he himself offers a way out of this. The life of knowledge is the life that is happy in spite of the misery of the world. The only life that is happy is the life that can renounce the amenities of the world. We have discussed in the last lecture that he himself lived such happy life by renouncing the amenities of the world. Now, this is also, it reminds us of Tagore saying, our shastras do instruct us practice self-control, not for the sake of piety alone, but also for the sake of happiness. Shukhati sangi yato vavit. That is, if you want your desire fulfilled, keep it in check. If you want to enjoy beauty, be calm. By quelling the lust of your appetite and purifying yourself. For Wittgenstein, to live happily is to be in accord with the world. That is, if my living is in tune with the whole world, I feel happy. If not, unhappy. What he means is that if we can accept whatever happens in the world, be it happiness, be it misery, without any grudges, then it will ensure a perfectly contented and happy world. A man who is happy must have no fear, not even in face of death. Only a man who lives not in time but in the present is happy. Fear in face of death is the best signs of a false or bad life. Now, now this happy and contented life does not advocate asceticism or rejection of the world as we know, he says once, Future religion will not be ascetic in the sense that people will go without food or drink. Seeing the 
the world rightly is not a matter of contemplating some discrete sphere of truths. Rather, it is saying that a blade of glass, a speck of dust, art slowly delight will bring forth heaven's glorious light. Here also we find Tagore articulating the same uh, motive. This, there are two poems here, couldn't do it properly. Liberation through ascetic denial? No, not for me. I'll taste the sweetness of freedom through countless bonds of joy. In this very jar of clay you pour again and again your wines of different colors and flavors. I'll not shut the doors of senses, no, never. Your joys, O oh God, will ever remain real for me in the midst of all the earthly joys of color, song and scent. Uh, like this poem shows how he differs from uh, Upanishadic concept of the world. Now there's a similar poem. Now we can see that the god of the Tractatus is not a traditional god of theologians. In fact, the Tractatus is a critic of traditional metaphysical or theological conception of God, which claims that the existence of God can be proved by factual reasoning, and at the same time there will be necessity. That is, they make substantial trans-empirical truth claims for the factual propositions constituting the argument. Wittgenstein argues against this. Now looking back to our earlier questions, we, we, we might now conclude by saying that Wittgenstein's views on religion actually was not contrary to those of logic and language of the Tractatus. They were at par, not in the world, but the conditions of the world. Once we understand this, we find no problem in grasping in which sense he, see, he sees the problem of language, life, and the world from a religious point of view. In earlier, lect in earlier lectures, we are apprised of the fact that discussion about religion, spirituality, God, or religious consciousness would fall into the domain of the nonsensical, as they are not concerned with depicting state of affairs or facts. We understand that a beyond is there which although one cannot speak of it, can somehow grasp it through the world. And this beyond in the field of religion manifests imperceptibility of God in the world. And it's being one with ethics and aesthetics on the one hand, and a profane spirituality on the other. This nonsensicality is not paradoxical, as it talks about two distinct points of views, Viewing the world from the point of view of eternity provides one with the right view of the world, which is somehow inexpressible from the point of view of mundane facts. One might bring an analogy from Indian philosophy here and explain that pantheistic worldview is the view from Paramarthiko point of view and that God does not reveal himself in the world is from the point of view of Babahara. All these points will be more succinct once we focus on the play the King of the Dark Chamber by Tagore, which we know had an impact on young Wittgenstein as far as his views on religion and spirituality is concerned. And when in later life in 1937, he was giving a lecture on aesthetic psychology and religious belief. At that time, he, along with one of his uh, students, Smythes, he read this uh, drama, Tagore's drama, once again before he delivers this address on uh, religious belief. But uh, I'm afraid the time is up, so I cannot really go into that part of my uh, essay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarkar. When Professor Sarkar first came and proposed to deliver on with Genstein and Rabindranath, I could hear some silent discussions among some of our fellows. Why these two persons? Today it has become clear why these two persons in the lecture. Professor Sarkar has very clearly, in different perspectives, philosophical, ideological, literary, linguistic, 
uh, from the current perspective, she has explained how these two persons were brought <coughs> to our discussion and knowledge. So I thank you very much. Not only you have cleared your standing, uh, but also <coughs> we could come to uh, so many of the clarifications in our ideas about what actually inspired your lecture. So once more, I thank you very much. Now, uh, uh, this lecture is open for our discussion. Formless, you say, is it journey from form to formless. But again, you say that the formless is to be manifest in the form. Now, how do you uh, explain this? If formless is ultimately to be manifest in the form, then in that case it ceases to be formless because it has to be manifest in the form. So the distinction between saying and sowing ultimately is dissolved because formless has to be sown, not to be said. But if it is manifest in form, then it is again becoming said. So is there not some kind of a conflict? And second point is about truth. Tagore is very clear about his notion of truth, which is artistic truth, maybe religious truth, ethical truth. But Wittgenstein has not used the word truth in this sense at all. He has logical truth, he has, let's say, empirical truth, scientific truth, but he keeps it open uh, about the inexpressible, whether you can call it truth at all. Even if we stretch our imagination and say that it is really the artistic, ethical uh, truth which Tiger talks about, then, then the question will arise, why Wittgenstein uh, again calls it nonsensical? So does he have any reservation about the very idea of extending the notion of truth beyond the limits of time? Now regarding your first question, that uh, if the formless is manifest in the form, then the distinction between saying and showing dissolves. Am I right? Okay. This, you know, what are the things that he treats them, the, those who are the formless, the limits of thought, limits of language, limits of the world, all these are formless. Now, how are they manifest in the forms? Here, comes the analogy of the poem. Like, referring to, to a poem, like uh, this friend, uh, Engelmann, uh, read a poem. And this poem was about the growth of a sprig into a hawthorn bush. A person, um, I think coming from the war or something, um, puts this Sprig and uh, like it becomes that big tree later, and it's an analogy. It's looking at the life in that way. But nothing is said there. Uh, I wish I had the poem. Then he sent. He was. Uh, he loved the poem. He sent it to Wittgenstein, and Wittgenstein said that look, this poem. In this poem, the unutterable is unutterably contained in the utterable. So, they are formless. And as formless, they are being manifested in the form. But that does not make them forms. They are still the formless. Only thing forms show them. This is your first uh, answer to your first question. And the 
Second question was? Truth. Truth. This is really, I thought about it uh, um, uh, for a long time. It is true that the way, the way Tagore is very clear about what he means by truth. And that is, that to some extent he believed that is subjective, that is personal, but personal with capital P, not in that sense subjective. And there are very um, conflicting, contradictory attributes also. But if, in spite of that, one can grasp an idea of Tagore's idea of truth. But not about Wittgenstein. You are right, sir. But I somehow find out, not in the English translation, but in German version, that when he is talking about the sensible world, when he is talking about logic, logical form, that all uh, all these, uh, all things under the same propositional form he was giving on the safer stroke notation and all these things are there. There he is using this truth operation and truth value, truth table. These are, these all come, uh, I have a feeling that these are called under the sensible representation of facts and logic. But when he is talking about the truth of solipsism, the truth of the mystical, that the value of the mystical, there also in some cases he uses the same German word D or height, the truth. But some of Pierce and Meninus have translated it as correct. No, truth and correct are not the same thing. But I have a hunch, as he is saying, that only those things are important which I could not write like which cannot be stated in a sensible language, it cannot be written in a sensible language. And I consider them most important. So that is, that is probably the truth, that is my answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the beginning you seem to <coughs> suggest a presupposition of a distinction between philosopher and poet. But I think towards the end of the lecture, there seemed to be a collapsing of the two. Can I venture to say that therefore there is no distinction between the philosopher and the poet? That's my first question. Uh, the second is when Wittgenstein keeps uh, uh, speaking about that, that should be passed over in silence. So is it that therefore one, uh, uh, it seems through your uh, lecture, that it is not saying that there should be absolute silence, but as you mentioned somewhere, suggestiveness of language. So are you saying that therefore what is passed over in silence see a different form through the metaphoric? They say there is a afterlife of that silence in metaphoric forms. And the third, uh, that is connected to again the first distinction between philosophy and poetry, and this is an idea that I had from the second lecture as well, that uh, the experience of the mystical, and you mentioned there that the experience of the mystical is not of the world, and I see um, a similarity, no, not in work, I haven't read much of work of that era, but uh, like experience of the mystical, not of the world, say in my altered state, like chemical induced state or opiate induced state, like Kubla Khan, like Ellen Ginsberg meeting God after chemically induced state. So, uh, so that experience of the mystical, though of not of the world, can be still induced by having bodily experience which is not of the world. Yeah. Okay, the first one you said about the distinction of philosophy and uh, literature. Uh, a philosopher and a poet. That is the age-old distinction, and you can find it, uh, find references also that uh, they are different. Um, like there are distinctions definitely, but but they are not uh, uh, like their uh, intentions, their ideas that are not conflicting. Sometimes in, in uh, some form or others that one complements the other. A poet, can, can, a poet can be philosophically significant 
and the, and the uh, philosophy also can be poetic. So you know, if you uh, if you understand Venn diagram, you draw a circle for philosopher, you draw a circle for poets. Now there's a, there are intersection in that person. There is no no conflict. You might say that it it, it dissolves or there is no self distinction. But there are other things also, other other spaces. Philosophy which is not poetry, poetry which is not philosophy. But there is an intersection where they match with each other. This is your first one. Second one was about the Passover in silence. So the silence. Oh, oh have yeah. other this is this is important. This is this is uh, interesting also. What does silence mean? Does that mean complete silence? Now. In uh, 90s, in uh, from 1990 onwards, uh, in the USA, there is a large group group of philosophers who interpret Tractatus, Tractatarian the silence, silence at the end of the book. That is something which is that one should be absolutely silent. One should be silent, and that is that. There is no, uh, there is nothing um, divine, nothing, uh, nothing is coming out of that silence. They are called the resolute theorists. They are very dominant. But there are other theorists also, non-resolute theorists. These people, they say, well, you will have to be silent and your silence is not a pregnant silence. It's not that some enlightening kind of nonsense will come out of this silence. But the other theorists, and there are a lot of them also, and this debate is going on, they think that, of course this silence refers to something which is, which is great and which is something which he uh, regarded as true and his biographies and his diaries and his letters that hint to that um, direction and you can see that I belong to this second group. But there is one important point which you suggested that in direction, that is something which is there in literature, in, in a poem you don't say things like the, the grass is green, the table is brown. You don't say things like that. There, there are metaphors. And by, by using metaphors, you say something which is not stated. And definitely, definitely there is this, this point that you are using it, you are using the language not in a descriptive Manner, not in a scientific manner. You are not stating the facts because what you want to represent is something which goes beyond facts. So, in that way, that way also, Wittgenstein also talks about music. Um, did I tell you that their family uh, was very uh, mus musical? Uh, his mother was uh, also at his. Uh, like they had this musical environment also and often he gives um, analogies and uh, interpretations and uh, elucidations through musical uh, narrations and all, the, all those things and he used to believe that music is something which gives you more, more than what the facts can give you. So in that way, this, uh, these things are there. Is it clear? Or, or, or you put your question again, I'll, I'll clarify it. And the third one? The, uh, when you spoke about the experience of the mystical in the last Oh, time. right. If you are a drug addict, so you can always be mystical and you can feel the interconnectedness in the universe. So, uh, we now, I, I refer you to a uh, very good article, not very long, 
It's written by Professor B. K. Motilal. It's on mysticism. Because he was, uh, Vimal Krishna Motilal was uh, um, uh, an Oxford philosopher. So, you know, he will have to tackle all these questions on mysticism, <coughs> on the mystical uh, truth, <coughs> and the, alle the allegation that Indian philosophy is all mystical. So, he really wrote it clearly how you will distinguish between a, 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 an addict <coughs> and a mystical philosopher. <coughs> As I was listening to you, uh, one thing that kind of kept on coming back to my mind was this famous conversation between Tagore and Einstein. Uh, the famous interview that happened between them. And, the, and the, the question, the primary question that got tackled was whether there is an objective truth uh, or whether the truth of the world that is known is primarily uh, human and solely human. In fact, at one point, uh, I think Einstein asked that would there be no humans anymore? Does that mean that the Apollo of Belvedere would no longer be beautiful? And Tagore says no. And uh, he replies that truth is ultimately human, and truth is a human, uh, it's a human truth that you have. I was just wondering, taking that into consideration, the idea of Tagore is primarily subjective in nature, or he puts the human being, the human subject, at the center of his conceptions of beauty or truth or aesthetics or anything of that sort, or where the idea of something that is more than something that is inexpressible, it is more something that can be expressed in a different kind of language, probably, rather than the language of facts, rather than the language of science, or the language of, uh, uh, shall we say, objective, uh, uh, you know, discourse. Now, I was just wondering whether, when you come to Wittgenstein, the subjective element doesn't seem to be there. I may be wrong, but that is my question. The subjective element doesn't seem to be there. Especially when you talk about, let us pass over in silence that which cannot be said. And that which cannot be said, and that which has to be passed over in silence, there is a note of reverence there when you pass over in silence. And when you connect it with the idea of eternity, the view from eternity, it is a domain, it is a sphere that is not human made. It is a sphere that probably has the emanation of godliness or divinity, something that is beyond the human. I wonder, in which case, despite all the similarities between Tagore and Wittgenstein, they are both, they may be using very similar metaphors even, but they are talking of entirely two different things. On the one hand, you have a human conception, primarily human subjective conception of uh, another kind of experience which cannot be uh, limited to factuality though. And in Wittgenstein's case, you have another experience which is probably divine in nature, and that cannot be touched by the humans. I don't know, I may be wrong. Um, no, it's a, um, I'll try to answer you, because you know all uh, these conceptions, they are not very, um, you know, kind of straightforward conception. So, you know, a lot of uh, nuances are uh, there. Probably I, I might, might have failed to grasp, uh, failed to present the nuances. Like, uh, uh, we tend to think, like your objection, I'm uh, stating it in a straightforward manner, it's something that usually Tagore is uh, treated to be an idealist. And Wittgenstein, on the other hand, when he's talking about picture theory of language, he's a robust realist. Because he's saying that the world is the totality of facts. 
Now, here, the word realism and idealism, basically, as it is used in, uh, in uh, philosophy literature, in both in Western and in Indian um, literature, they are not, they have, they have many shades of realism and many shades of idealism. And in case of Tagore, he himself, in I think in uh, one of the in one of his prose, he says that he believes in a kind of realism of idealism. And he says this kind of realism of idealism that we can understand within this purview of Indian philosophy. But probably Westerners will not be able to understand it. What is this? Now he is telling us every time the truth is subjective. But who is the subject? This subject is not the particular particular person having such and such uh, uh, properties, sitting in a particular chair and talking in a certain manner on a certain topic, that is not the subject. I myself have, I myself have these two aspects and when he's talking about the religion of an artist, when he is talking about aesthetical truth, he's not talking about this chotoam, the small eye whom you can point to, you are the subject. But he's talking about this higher subject, this Boroami, which he refers to with capital S when he's used subject and when he used the term person with capital person. And he, uh, he tries to be as lucid as possible in, in personality. Uh, like his lectures in USA, uh, which he delivers in English, which is not translated. Now, when he is talking about subjectivity, it's not Barclayan subjectivity, like S.E.S. Parsipian. He's, it, it's a difficult kind of, it, it is, he said that there are three kinds of being within us. One is physical, another is intellectual, and another is, that is personal. And all these things, all these uh, like, which comes uh, under the purview of art with capital A, they all refer to this person with capital P, which I have a feeling uh, is, not, is not subjective in the way we use the word subjective. And talking about Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein is also not a realist. Although the book begins with the statement that the world is the totality of facts. But the, this is a conclusion. Conclusion of what? Conclusion of analyzing the logic of our language. So we we are having this conclusion only via one's language. One doesn't go straight to the world as the totality of facts. So it is not a kind of realism. Rather, you might think of it uh, as, a, as a kind of linguistic idealism. So, uh, you know, if they are not as different. You, they can, they might converge also. I'll think about it. Okay. Yeah. See, when you're talking about language, you this what you said just now, also treating it almost like an empirical fact. The language as it exists, as if there is a language over there. Uh, so, and you're making a difference between lim when you're talking about the limits of language, and again, the distinction that you're making are between the sensical and nonsensical language, the limits of language and what I, I was thinking there's a third way of looking at language, 
because language is not just given, language is a social reality. It's loaded with concepts, socially constructed <coughs> concepts. So how do you see this third dimension of language? Means it's not like the language which is already existing and to be used. It's something which has power relationships, which has got lots to, which is, which is a outcome of uh, of the of the uh, power context within the society. So how do you see that? Well, I see it. I see it as a good question, but totally irrelevant in my case because I, this is my precept. I'm talking about Wittgenstein's idea of language and Tagore's idea of language, and he's a philosopher of language, and another is a, a <coughs> genius, poetic genius, and I'm trying to find out the similarities, you know, which had some relevance in, in the uh, interpretations as well. And you are offering a different, no, no, and this is not limits of language, this is not my, this is not my uh, phrasing. On, and I'm not, I'm a, you can treat me as an interpreter, interpreter of the cryptic writings of Wittgenstein from the point of view of Tagore. Now, here, this third, like the uh, discussion of language, the way you are uh, uh, presenting, yes, that is, an, uh, that is a view of language, but that doesn't come here, okay? Okay, fine. You, I didn't mean it that you were saying it. I was saying that the reference to these two. You know, how, how, how does the language? Well, in any way, it's okay. Thank you. I was not too sure how this. And I'm sure it will be able to get to answer to this. So, um, this is regarding the question of silence and the truth in literature. Because uh, this discussion just reminded me of the situation of someone like Kafka or someone like Lars Spector who um, lived only uh, through writing. Not that uh, they lived only through writing, we say that their reality or the real people they were, that only existed only when they got to write. It is very much uh, out in Kafka's diaries. And uh, Shiksus refers to that respect to her own self and how she uh, wanted to burn herself because she was she was not uh, ready to live any longer because she was unable to write. So in that kind of a situation, this whole experience of literature to writing becomes the very uh, means of survival, and that itself becomes the truth, and not uh, and it itself becomes the sensible and the sensical. So being beyond nonsensical. So in that kind of a situation, how are we to um, look at this even approach of Tagore, though I have not read his works, how are we to look at uh, literature in that point of view? Is it, is it um, beyond truth or is it bringing some, is it constructing truth? Therefore truth is constructible rather than having a truth as a whole and therefore to achieve it. Uh, I don't know uh, whether I have understood you correctly, but it uh, but it seems like uh, Tagore's concept of truth. It's not a not a particular not an individual whole. Like I'm I'm uh, telling you, like the fact how are facts? They are uh, abstractions. Suppose you learn, uh, you go to learn physiology. What is there? You are learning physiology, it's a science. One teaches you, you learn it. How is it possible that someone can teach you and you can learn it? Because they have some objective properties. You know that human being has certain number of bones and uh, muscles and all these things are there. And you learn it. You can learn it only because this body, this human body, has then been abstracted from the whole interconnected reality. Suppose you are a doctor and your son is ill. 
Now, you think, you might think that you are going to operate on him and you, you can think that uh, I'm going to operate on a body. <coughs> you can do that, but then Tegur will say, if you do that, then you will not touch the reality. What is that reality? The reality is that you are the mother of that son. Your son is related to you in a particular relationship. And again, there are lots and lots and lots of mothers there. Only thing, there is a screen in between. You think, I am only the mother of my son. When, whenever you realize the truth, the truth of motherhood, at that time, you don't have this distinction between you being a mother and other mothers also. You relate to other mothers by being in that relationship. You mean the all beings are related, uh, are related in an interconnected way. Everything is related with everything in an interconnected way. If that is the truth, then teaching a human body, having a number of bones and all these things, these are being abstracted from all these relations. They become fact and this whole thing becomes true. I don't know whether we, uh, I was able to uh, get to your question. Uh, like if it is, you think that whenever he is writing, it's his reality, his truth, no problem about that. Only thing, Tegor will say that as a writer also, he will not uh, he will not alienate himself from other writers, from other non-writers, from other beings, from other 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 um, animals, insects, uh, other non-living universe also. Also, you mentioned some binaries between religion and spirituality. Today, you mentioned a binary between art with the capital A and science and objectivity and subjectivity. Okay, so are these binaries tenable at all? Like, isn't religion spiritual uh, spirituality, or is uh, science very different from arts? Because scientific truth have been revised. You know, people keep revising scientific truth. Had it been an absolute truth, it wouldn't have undergone revisions. There's a lot of imagination also. There's a lot of imagination in scientific truth. And that is why we contest that. And over the years, we see a lot of scientific facts have been revised accordingly. Isn't it? There was a time it was said that women cannot do maths. There was a time it was said that women speak in a particular way. So all those are quite contested now. And they don't hold any truth anymore. So science, which means, is not really the objective truth that we speak of. Similarly, uh, the objectivity and subjectivity, and they do, don't they spill over uh, all these binaries, don't they already spill over each other? You are right, madam, and I also don't disagree with you. Because in my first lecture, and again in my second lecture, I said that uh, it was uh, before spirituality and uh, religion, they were inseparably intertwined with each other. Even etymology points to that. Only thing, these days, these days, because of the, uh, because uh, one, uh, uh, very crudely you are quite present, the association of violence with religion has led people to think about think about the association of religion and institutionalized religion and spirituality and trying to trying to bring something which is important and leave something which is not important which is beneficial for mankind and treating giving them some name and trying to thus thus uh, get out of that crisis of the situation. 
This is the way. It's not that like what tight divisions. And when uh, Tagore divides between science and art, now he was he divided it. And fact and truth also, he wanted to divide it, but it was at the same time true that these divisions, they are not uh, like watertight compartments. And one shows the other. Objectivity is embedded in subjectivity. So they are not like binaries. So I agree with it. So any more question from our audience? Please. I have for myself, I am able to understand how. But though I am a philosophy student, I was not in a position to my mind. I was not in a position to understand the teacher as fully. Or at least mm, I am not able to follow it because of his language, because of his uh, twisting of statements and this and that. But what is my request is at least you, you would write a book on Jintan to know by myself. That's my request. Right. Okay, this is your suggestion. So, uh, my friends from Bengal, will you put any queries about Rabindranath Thakur and philosophy? No. Then I may request Professor Pradham to please. Um, I have a question only related to God. Okay, one is in response to Professor Narayanan. Uh, it is, you have rightly said that Wittgenstein uh, talks about the beyond with a reverence. And uh, he is not subjectivizing it. That is the contention. That is very clear. Uh, he is not bringing any feelings into it. In that sense, it is not subjective. But Tagore also divinizes the truth. For him, that truth, that person, <coughs> uh, from which he has derived the word personality, it really is a divine person. And uh, he is very much deriving the notion of Purusha from the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, though it is subjective because he is bringing human element into the center, but at the same time, he is divinizing the human. So in that sense, perhaps both can come to a similar conclusion that the truth is not my uh, possession. Truth is something objective. But objective in the sense that it is beyond me, uh, beyond us in that sense. As to the question, why he says God doesn't reveal himself in the world, what will be the uh, meaning of this enigmatic sentence. Does it mean that God is transcendent, which obviously uh, is the meaning, and therefore he doesn't reveal himself in the world? Now, the question is, if God is completely detached from the world, uh, then how does God really uh, becomes meaningful? The idea of God becomes meaningful for for the humans. And why Wittgenstein should at all introduce the notion of God when there is no way God can uh, reveal himself in the world? So, is there any uh, more light that you can throw on this? Thank you. Uh, uh, he says that God doesn't reveal himself in the world, like uh, very crudely and very simply put, God is not a fact. And the world is the totality of facts. So God is not a fact. So what is God? God is equated with, in many places, of course in the notebooks, with the meaning of life, with the meaning of the world, and with um, ethics, aesthetics, everything. So all together, ethics, aesthetics, religion, meaning of life and meaning of the world, all these things, they, can, they are not facts. So they cannot be in the world. They cannot be in the world, they are the limits of the world. As a limit, 
they are being manifested in the world in the way the unutterable is unutterably contained in the other. But so here he says way. God doesn't reveal himself. That word reveal is again, uh, it comes to the manifest. Huh. So is it not uh, the case that he is saying that God doesn't reveal himself in the world? Though uh, it is very clear that God is not in the world. Not in the world. I, he could have said God is not in the world, but why did he say God doesn't reveal himself in the world? If God is the meaning of the world, then God is still connected with the world. God is, uh, definitely God is connected with the world in the way I am my world, in the way solipsism expresses the truth. Oh, there he uses the word truth. The solip and how come solipsism is true? The solipsism coincides with pure realism. So there is this, it's not, it's not inside, it's not outside, it's in the boundary. And uh, you know, last night I was reading a bit of Tagore and I found a very strong uh, suggestion that um, God is almost the same, that God is not in the world, and in this uh, uh, like Hindu Slim riot and all these things, uh, he almost clearly states that only way out is to throw all the through all these religious denominations. So in that way, so they have for, they are, they have similarities as well. But still, I'll think about the meaning of revealing, and I'll find out the German word also. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? No. So then we come to the last stage of the drama. I have so many questions. I have so many questions. And I believe that the questions are not merely meant for the enrichment of the questioners. It is also meant for the enrichment of the answer. Yes. That is why we welcome questions. We don't disregard any question. Any question put to this chair, put to this table, will be honored and respected and answered. So, <coughs> with all this comment, I say that we honor your questions. Uh, yeah, I have I been there in the next table. I will have made so many of the questions. Uh, the other day, <laughs> the other day. Uh, when I put the question, have you looked upon the Indian tradition and its impact on Wittgenstein? Uh, so many people perhaps interpreted me in a different way, whether it is a traditionalist, etc., <laughs> etc. Et but anyway, formless <laughs> in form, it is not a simple thing. Formless in form, it is not a simple thing. We have to look into it. And, uh, and Professor Sarkar has discussed almost all similarities between the two figures. Was there no, was there no dissimilarities between them? We were also interested in their contradictions. Very good question. <coughs> lots and lots and lots of dissimilarities. In uh, spite of their dissimilarities, yeah. there are some similarities. And uh, I had also some questions on what Haripriya had to philosophy and poetry. Yeah, <coughs> so uh, I'll have put some questions regarding that as well. And <clears throat> again, Rabindranath Thakur's ideas, his philosophies, his ideologies, everything was derived from Indian tradition. I disagree, sir. Okay. <laughs> but <coughs> Rabindranath Thakur is not, I believe, is not out of Indian tradition although he stood for universalism. And Rabindranath Thakur was so popular in Germany, as you have yourself expressed, and he was well, well translated. And he was the most, perhaps one of the most influential person in German psychology. What exactly was his impact on Winston Winston? That's why I was trying to find out. So anyway, 
so these are some of the simple questions. Not simple, that way. Anyway, so I thank Professor Sarkar so much because the subjects he delivered, in which, particularly me, I had earlier very little knowledge, particularly uh, <coughs> German philosopher Genstein. So I enriched myself in so many ways, and I believe so many of my friends enriched themselves through her lecture. In that sense, we are thankful to the Institute, in the sense that it is through the policy of the Institute that we have the opportunity of listening to her lectures. We once more accord our thanks to Professor Ajit. Um, uh, with these few words, of course, uh, I would like to conclude that this session of the seminar has been ended. And uh, once more, we hope that we shall be able to listen to better, better lectures from Professor Sodar in future. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank everyone for the question. And uh, like, I'm sorry if I sounded rude to someone. Uh, I can discuss with you on this amount, uh, this account of language uh, in the high tea hall. Thank you. Thank you.